added to these were public lectures on moral authors, Terence, Valerius Maximus, and Virgil. In addition, Bartzitza was obliged to be involved in at least two public disputations each year, either as a participant in the disputation or as a summarizer. In addition to these activities, there were voluntary lectures which were outside the statutory curriculum and for which the students paid Bartzitza directly. These voluntary lectures allowed Bartzitza to go beyond the confines of the normal curriculum by reading a wider range of authors and taking advantage of newly discovered texts, of which there were many. Well, so far, as a teacher at this level, as a lector at the university, Bartzitza has drawn upon two sources of income. What he was paid by the Venetian authorities and what he could garner in from individual students. A third source was a not uncommon one for someone in his position. Because outside the university setting, he ran his own private school in a large tenement building on the Via Pozzo Campione. He took in boarders, as many as 20 at any one time, and offered instruction to them at various levels. For pupils at an elementary stage, as well as supplementary teaching for university students. And it was for these students, these private students if you wish, that many of Bartzitsa's brief grammar and rhetorical manuals were composed. In addition, it was here in his household, as he called it, that Bartzitsa supervised his scriptorium. This was a writing school, yet another little earner, you see, where his assistants and advanced pupils engaged in copying existing and newly discovered ancient works. What standard of living these various sources of income enabled Bartzitsa to maintain is not easy to gauge. We should note that in 1410 he became the foster father to eight children, and this at a time when the Hungarian incursions and the plague had caused serious food shortages uh, around uh, the Veneto. On the whole, I think we can reasonably conclude that altogether his income was a little more than adequate, but certainly not extravagant. Our second portrait is of one Cosma Raimondi. He was a pupil of Bartzitsa for a brief time around 1421. Well, if the details of Bartzitsa's life are a little difficult to come by in places, in the case of Raimondi, they scarcely exist. That he was born in Cremona seems certain. When is when is less certain, but probably around 1400. Of his early schooling, we know nothing at all, but it is clear, since Raimondi himself tells us that he studied oratory and philosophy under <coughs> Bar Sitza around 1421. We know, too, that his capacity in Latin was sufficient to impress his teacher, Bartzitsa, since Bartzitsa trusted him in the copying of an extremely important Ciceronian, newly discovered Ciceronian manuscript. However, if Raimondi 
would appear to have made a promising beginning. The sequel was to be quite another story. What were the aspirations of this young scholar, this young humanist in training, this Cosma Raimondi? What future did he see for his himself? This is revealed to us in his letters, of which 16 uh, survive in manuscript, all of them from the last six years of his life. For Raimondi, the true calling of the scholar was plain and simple. It was to be an orator and a poeta. He tells us this most directly in a letter, in a letter which he wrote at Avignon around 1429. It's a most important letter and the circumstances of its composition will concern us uh, in due course. For the moment, let's simply record what he says and expand a little upon what he means. In embracing oratory and poetry, I embraced those things which at Athens, at Rome, in all the finest cities in the world, were given the highest place of honor. Elsewhere, he tells us that it was for training in these two pursuits, which for him defined the word eloquence, that he went to study under Bartzitsa. He also reveals in this same letter that what he means by attaining eloquence as an orator is not simply becoming competent in everyday speech but rather mastering every single style of speaking and recovering the ancient manner of writing. In short, preparing himself for employment by the state or by a ruler, composing in appropriate classical style every form of formal or written communication. Mastery of eloquence can bring renown to, and Raimondi is desirous of that, no less than others. But for my Raimondi, the value of eloquence is first and foremost practical. The same is true of eloquence in poetry. It is clear that in later life, Raimondi aspired to be a poet in the conventional sense. In the beginning, however, facility in Latin verse composition, like facility in prose, was essentially a means to an end. And the end was employment. Well, aspirations modest enough. <coughs> and talent, it would seem, sufficient to accomplish them. But this is not to be a story of success. <coughs> Raimondi attained very little of what he hoped. The letter from which I quoted above was written from Avignon around 1429. It is addressed to the Senate at Milan. In it, Raimondi explained that some years before, when he was still resident in Italy, he had appealed to this same body to provide him with some means whereby he could continue his studies, presumably with Marzitsa, some modest administrative post that would furnish the wherewithal for his fees and his books and the necessities of living. The Senate had declined to assist him. Raimondi had tried other avenues too, but had finally despaired of finding any employment. 